Hello and welcome to an all new South Texas Pride podcast. I'm Ivan Herrera and today I'm joined by Melissa Gulke, an archivist with UTSA's Special Collections. Melissa, thank you so much for joining me today. You're welcome. Happy to be here. So in this episode, we're going to be celebrating LGBTQ plus History Month and discussing some local history and the people who helped influence San Antonio's queer history. But first, can you tell me a little bit about what you do with UTSA Special Collections? Absolutely. Um, I've been with UTSA Special Collections for 13 years. I started um, as a graduate assistant and fortunately when I got my master's came on board full time and it was really this perfect dovetailing of my interest and um, the collecting trajectory um, of going out and, and really trying to grow LGBTQ collections. I am a scholar of LGBTQ history. And within the framework of special collections, I am able to do outreach such as this uh, podcast and presentations and go out in the community and work with individuals and organizations about the possibility of donating their records and just letting them know what resources we have available. The collections that we have at UTSA Special Collections are accessible to anyone. They can request access, come to one of our reading rooms and get hands-on experience with primary sources. Additionally, the majority of our LGBTQ collections have been digitized and are accessible online. So that makes it much more, uh, it makes it easier for researchers who might be in remote locations and can't make it here to San Antonio. That's what I do. That's what I'm going to continue to do, hopefully until I retire, which is a little ways down the road. Thank you so much for sharing some of that and also for sharing more about UTSA Special Collections. Now, let's get into some of the people who helped spur San Antonio's queer culture, starting with Arthur Hapbeltman, who has been referred to as the fairy godmother of San Antonio by some. Now, Hap, as he was known by many, was a San Antonio influencer type. Uh, well, what we would call an influencer now, but maybe back then it wasn't <laughs> called that. And he would create several developments during his time alive, including the Bonham Exchange, which still serves as a safe space for queer people even today. Can you talk to me about Hap's impact in San Antonio in terms of development and also culture? His impact um, was huge. If we start look with looking at Hap as a visionary for the city. He grew up in San Antonio and his grandmother used to take him downtown shopping. So he came in contact with all the historical buildings in the downtown area. And after he went to uh, college and got his uh, different degrees, came back, he saw that the city was potentially under threat for eradicating some of these really historic structures such as the Aztec Theater, uh, the Majestic, the historic uh, Joskies building. So he was very much aware of uh, conservation and spearheaded uh, several conservation efforts to ensure that historic buildings were not destroyed in the downtown area. So we're very fortunate to have that legacy, which left, leaves so many structures intact. Perhaps one of his most important contributions that a lot of folks aren't aware of is how much Hap Veltman influenced the development of the Riverwalk as a venue, or a, an attraction not only for tourists, but for locals. Hap was the first to open a restaurant on the river walk where the seating was down on the river level. It was the uh, Kangaroo Court. He had several restaurants on the river and all of them had seating on the river, which made a huge difference. Other uh, real estate developers and restaurateurs followed suit. And because of that, we have 
the river as we know it today. Thanks very much um, to Hap Feltman. And I think he probably doesn't get um, the credit that he is due uh, for really transforming the river walk into what it is now. The other really instrumental task or project that he took on with Bernie Lifschultz was purchasing the Blue Star. It was a warehouse filled with old tires. And for residents who know Blue Star now, it has been transformed into a very creative arts community for the community. Uh, Gene Elder, who we'll talk about in a minute, was the original manager of Blue Star, was very much involved in getting artists to buy in to the notion of having workspace at Blue Star. So thanks to Hap and Bernie's vision, we have uh, an incredible arts hub uh, that can be enjoyed by citizens and tourists alike. Now, I can't talk about Arthur without talking about his good friend, Gene Elder, who you just uh, mentioned a little bit. Now, he was responsible for documenting years and years of gay history throughout his life, so much so that he's been referred to as the clip and file queen. Now, UTSA has a lot of those archives from the Happy Foundation digitized in special collections, where many people can see decades of LGBTQ history. Can you talk about Elder's impact in terms of San Antonio's gay culture and history? Absolutely. Um, I think at the onset, I do need to say that Hap and, and Gene Elder were very good friends. They met in the 70s when Gene was a student at St. Mary's. And Gene went on to become the manager of the San Antonio country, which was uh, Hap's really big premier gay disco that opened on North St. Mary's on the river. Uh, like his other establishments, uh, he had the foresight to really advertise broadly for the San Antonio country and put an ad in Playboy, which I thought was quite interesting. But Elder once said to me that the San Antonio country, which has taken on this very iconic, magical status in the queer community, was a, an open presentation for anyone who was liberated and liberal thinking. The country was a place for them to go. It wasn't just for the LGBT community. It was a place for anyone. Uh, women who had gay hairdressers would come there and bring their friends and allies of the queer community would all uh, come together in that space. And Jean was very much a part of that. When you look at photographs of the interior of the country, it is a very modern presentation for the 70s. And having grown up during the 70s, <laughs> I realize exactly how modern that was. They had TV sets and lounges and pool tables. And there was a space in the center of the bar where the drag queens held court, but it was such an important space and Folks that I've talked to who remember going to the country just kind of get teary-eyed. It was, it was something special for one man in particular. It's where he met his partner of 40 plus years now. So it just uh, was such a big thing and such perhaps such a visionary way to provide a space, a queer space. And then when, um, the country was sold. And that's that's a, a story in and of itself, probably for a separate podcast. Um, Hap purchased the Bonham, Bonham. And of course, Gene was a very integral part uh, of a special section of the Bonham until Gene passed away in 2019. When Hap passed of AIDS in 1988, there was a provision in his will to set up a nonprofit profit um, LGBTQ archives. And Gene Elder was appointed director of that archives. So from he had started collecting prior to 1988, but you imagine all these decades, 40 plus years of clipping and filing, 
it is an unbelievable resource for researchers, for our community. It's housed, however, in the Bonham, which is a really old building. I was just in there last week and they did a lot of remodeling during the pandemic. Um, the back of the building, however, has its wear and tear. And jeans clipping and filing has led to boxes being stacked to the ceiling with just amazing resources for our community and for researchers. In 2012, um, Gene donated, I believe it was 2012, his journals to uh, UTSA Special Collections. They're huge tomes. Uh, there are 23 of them. And inside he kept his personal history, the community history, uh, his HIV records, which normally that's not something we would keep. Uh, medical records, but he thought that was such an important chapter of people's lives that it needed to be preserved, that he was regularly being tested for HIV. Uh, Gene himself did so much for the local arts community. He himself was an amazing artist uh, in many different mediums. Uh, ceramics, he taught handmade paper classes at Southwest School of Art. And he was also uh, very political. He ran for mayor of San Antonio back in the 70s uh, on the party party ticket. So that's just one of those tidbits that made Gene so special. He was a very good friend and he's really missed by, by all of us and made so many significant um, contributions to our community. Folks can access his personal archives at UTSA, uh, as well as the publications that he loaned to us to digitize. Well, so thank you so much for sharing about Jean and Arthur. Their stories are a huge, huge part of San Antonio's queer history. Uh, and I do want to talk a little bit of, a little bit before them. Uh, San Antonio, we know as military city. So I, I want to talk about some queer military history. In a blog post, you discuss the off limits and out of bounds places where military members were not allowed to be due to a crackdown of homosexual activity during World War II. But even after military police would raid these places where people where queer people would come together and declare them out of bounds and off limits, what were these establishments like and how did queer military members avoid getting caught? The military off limits list uh, that I reference was one of those serendipitous finds. Uh, one of our archivists was going through some vertical files and came across this list. And it has, oh, Gosh, dozens of places on it, restaurants, bars, clubs, residences. And after the name and address of each place, in parentheses, there's a reason that the military has declared uh, this establishment off limits. Could be for venereal contacts, body houses, prostitution, um, lack of cleanliness, so a whole host of reasons. And what scholars of queer history have found after studying these lists is that they're, they're very coded. You can read the list and know that if a place, reasonably know, that if a place listed venereal contacts, it wasn't always just female prostitution. It also indicated homosexual. Uh, contact. So it is a way for us to uncover where queers were coming together in cities. Um, I, I do need to give a little bit of context for why off limits lists came around besides the obvious reasons. Uh, the military during even prior to, uh, to World War II was very concerned with the behaviors, the moral behaviors of armed forces personnel. And of course, at that time, homosexuality was considered immoral and deviant. And the Congress enacted legislation called the May Act, which was a tool by which the military could regulate 
the behavior of armed forces personnel. And the off limits list were an offshoot of that legislation. Off limits lists uh, were put up in the barracks um, at Fort Sam, uh, the different bases around San Antonio, across, across the US. And they were also posted outside the doors of the establishments that were be de being declared off limits. So there could be no confusion that this place was off limits to military personnel. However, ironically, that very tool that they implemented became a way for gay men and women to find each other. When they were posted to a new city, all they had to do to find the spots um, where queers were coming together is go and look at off the off limits list, read the coded language and head out for a night in the town. The crux of that is how do you keep from getting discovered when the military are constantly in these places, you had to make sure you wore your civvies or your civilian clothes and you kept a very low profile. There was a great risk if you were in the military and discovered at an off limits establishment, you could be court-martialed and dishonorably discharged, outed to your family. It was a big, risk, but folks are willing to take it. During World War II, oftentimes individuals who were coming into the military who were gay or lesbian got into the military to get out of their small towns. And now they are encountering for the first time others who have same-sex inclinations. So it's a very complex dynamic going on. And the military is, much as they try to control it, they were really, it was a big task. The other component of Off Limits was the military's attempt to control venereal disease, which was rampant, uh, especially in San Antonio. It wasn't, as I stated, just female prostitution. The health department released a report in which the greatest proportion of reported venereal disease was coming from casual contacts, casual pickups, having sex in cars. And there was a very good possibility it was coming from same sex interactions. So it's the military off limits list uh, from a historian standpoint is a gold mine of finding out where queers were coming together. These places were in most cases real dives, just hole in the wall places. Uh, a lot of them during 1945 were on the east side of San Antonio. So it's a peripheral space and that to a certain degree would insulate it from military incursions. However, other venues were really nice. Like uh, there was one, the Lifesaver Grill. Many of them were integrated, which was another buffer for homosexuals is uh, going into what were known during the twenties as black and tan clubs. There were a lot of integrated clubs that were on the off limits list. Does that give you a pretty good sense of what that was about? Yes, thank you so much for answering that and sure. for, for really going into the history of that. And for my final question, I, I do want to go a little bit further back in history and delve into the history of how drag has progressed and at times regressed in terms of societal impact. Now, in a blog post, you discussed the Gay Paris Boys Will Be Girls review, which drew in crowds and gave people a glimpse into the world of gender bending performances. However, not everyone was on board with these types of performances being presented in downtown venues in the 30s and 40s, including law enforcement. Can you tell me about how drag culture, about the drag culture of those times, and if you see any parallels to what we're seeing now? I see par very thin parallels. So before I address that, let me talk about drag culture, which has its roots in San Antonio and elsewhere. Back in the 
late 1800s, early 1900s, when vaudeville or variety theater was very popular. It was an, an affordable uh, entertainment option and female impersonators were big, big, a big draw for crowds. Um, even in San Antonio, when I came across those facts, uh, I was really blown away to find that drag culture existed that early on. And then it morphed into something a, a little bit different as the 30s came along. Something called the pansy craze was sweeping America. It came out of Harlem where heterosexual uh, individuals and groups would go into Harlem to become voyeurs of deviant culture and drag bars uh, balls were a part of that so this this craze just ripples across the country and in san antonio beginning in the 1930s you see advertisements in the local papers for female impersonators they're getting top billing in these clubs little cabarets clubs many of which were located in what we might consider San Antonio's theater district, where the Majestic is, where the Texas theater was, um, the Aztec. We have uh, images in our photograph collection that shows these little cabarets. So it's, it really kind of gives you a, a taste for um, this subculture that's happening. This continued through the 40s, um, where we have the Gay Paris program that has images of performers, uh, female impersonators on it, uh, many of whom were based in Seattle and traveled the country and ended up coming to San Antonio. Uh, the popularity of female impersonators was really strictly for entertainment value. That's why it was such a big draw across all those, all those decades. However, if drag performers left the club and there were men traipsing around in women's garb on the streets of San Antonio, that was a whole different dynamic. Uh, in one case, several drag performers uh, were partying at their hotel in drag and one of the other uh, customers of the hotel contacted the police to come in and round them up. He just did not think that was appropriate. So they were all hauled off to jail. And, uh, you know, being the just the quintessential performers that they were, they gave a drag show while they were in, in jail and entertained the other inmates, which I thought was very classic. The um, DA could not really get charges to stick. Uh, nothing that was really a legitimate charge. So the performers were released and told to leave the city, which they did not. They were hauled in again and a court date is set. And so there's, there's a lot of publicity about this pending court case of these sexual deviants, these gender benders uh, most of whom proclaimed that they were heterosexual, by the way. So folks in San Antonio who maybe couldn't afford to go to the cabarets, go to the nightclubs, are anticipating this public trial of these female impersonators. At the last minute, there again, the prosecutors decide we just don't have the evidence to bring these folks to, to trial, to court. And it was dismissed. And I assume they left town, but who knows if they, they hung around. After all, they were making some good money with top billing. The phone at the courthouse started ringing off the hook with irate San Antonians wanting to know why this wasn't going to proceed. They were really looking forward to seeing this play out in the courtroom. So in some ways, there is this parallel of prejudice where 
performance of drag, female impersonation, is appropriate as entertainment. But if you take it out of the context of entertainment and in our culture, layer all sorts of other things on it, um, then you're going to have outcry from those who see it as, as deviant. The backlash we're going through right now is it's a very different thing and really would not be a fair comparison to what was happening with the court case in, in the 1930s. But it's, I've noticed it goes in waves. Uh, back in the 1900s when female impersonators were in vaudeville, the most famous of which was Julian Etange. He was so convincing to audiences, they really thought he was a woman but folks started to question his masculinity because he could pull off transforming himself so convincingly that in his personal life, he became hyper-masculine. He would get into fights. He presented this very masculine aura. So he was trying to protect himself from the potential backlash of being outed. And in fact, he was a queer man but he had to keep that under wraps. So you will have waves of discrimination for, for different reasons as social norms change and, um, and going forward, who knows what's on the horizon. Alyssa, thank you so much for sharing on the South Texas Pride podcast and for sharing the important LGBTQ history with us. Have a wonderful day. Thank you so much, Ivan, I appreciate it. Keep up to date with all of San Antonio's top news, weather, and so much more by clicking the like and subscribe buttons below. And once again, thanks for watching KSAT.